So maybe first and foremost, before we can actually go into detail, let's actually define you know, what economics is all about. So economics is about three important terms. You know, we basically, uh, firstly, it's about production, you know, in terms of what are, what are the goods and the services that the government needs to produce. And these goods and services are influenced by the, the needs on the ground in terms of what, what are the, the communities, the constituencies, you know, uh, need. So the government would make those decisions in terms of the production based on the people's needs. And then secondly, once the government has decided on what to produce in terms of the goods and services, they then need to, 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 to determine how these goods and services that are produced will actually reach you know, the intended beneficiaries. The government need, therefore need to develop the distribution systems. You know, how, do, how does the government make sure that the services that they are providing to the people uh, in terms of the goods and services are actually distributed and reach out to the people. And uh, lastly, the, the consumption, for whom are they producing you know, these goods and services in terms of like the intended beneficiaries? So that's basically the scientific study within the government institution in answering three broader questions which are the three main economic questions, what, how, and for whom. That means what, what goods and services does the government need to produce and how does this, I mean, how does the government decide to, to distribute these goods and services and for whom are these goods and services distributed? So in everyday life, you know, government is trying to answer these three broader questions you know, of economics. So you can actually look at economics you know, within the government uh, sector as the study of the allocation of scarce resources and, and the study of markets. In other words, you know, when the government decides on the goods and the services that they need to produce, do they have the adequate resources you know, that they, are, they require in terms of financial and non-financial resources to actually uh, meet the, you know, the requirements uh, in terms of the, the needs and the wants on the other side. So when you actually try and compare the, 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 the resources that the government um, has, I mean, has in terms of availability, you know, are they really sufficient to satisfy the, the needs and the wants? So more often, if not always the case, you find that the, 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 the resources that are available to the government are always limited. And the needs and the ones from the constituencies and the communities on the ground are unlimited. That actually creates an economic challenge of scarcity. So basically scarcity is, is whereby the government is faced with limited resources and faced with unlimited needs and wants. When the, the government is faced with scarcity, you know, uh, which is the problem of infinite and endless human needs and wants, it's, it's, the government needs to make decisions. And these decisions require the government that the, uh, that the government makes trade-offs, where you find that when the government looks at the endless uh, needs and wants, the government needs to prioritize. And once the government do that priority uh, uh, decision making, there they, they should be a trade off. Some of the needs and wants will take priority over the others. And these are the economics around the decisions that are made by the government. And in the absence of scarcity and alternative uses of available resources is actually it creates a situation that is not realistic. You know, in other words, the government will always be faced with, the, I mean, with an economic problem of scarcity. You know, so does economic involve the study of choices? In other words, you know, in terms of making uh, the priorities, and once you make those priorities, like I said before, you have to make these uh, trade-offs. You know, how does then the government? Um, created these resources. These resources are created from what is called as economic growth. You know, once the economy grows, 
the government will have the ability to charge more taxes from, from the people within that country. And what are the indicators of economic growth? One of the major, like uh, one of the most popular indicators of, of, of economic growth is what is called a gross domestic product, which is a GDP. And it is very important for us to actually understand what gross, I mean, domestic product is. Uh, in, in a nutshell, a gross domestic product is, is a mere addition of all the goods and services, the value of all goods and services that are produced within a, a, an economy uh, within a given period of time, normally a year. So if, for example, let's take, for example, Namibia or any other country, if everyone within the country, either individuals or firms or households, they produce goods and services. When you put all the value of all those goods and services together within a, within a particular year, then you get what is called the gross domestic product. In other words, if you compare the gross domestic product from last year to this year, any difference, whether it's, it's negative or positive, will determine whether the, the economy is shrinking if it's negative or is growing if it's positive. Now, uh, the, 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 the gross domestic product can either be viewed as a nominal gross domestic product or real gross domestic product. The nominal uh, gross domestic product is when you look at the value of all the goods and services at a face value. In other words, uh, if, if, if you look at uh, the value of all goods and services in terms of the monetary value, and let's say it's about uh, $500 billion, that will be the face value. But would you have, I mean, uh, purchase the same goods and services in five years from, I mean, uh, from now? Uh, uh, compared to what you would actually get in five years like previously. So there, would, there is what is called as inflation. Once you factor the inflation into the gross domestic product, then you get what is called real gross domestic product. In other words, it actually tells you the, the exact amount of goods and services that you can get in the value of the current uh, financial power. In other words, so when you look at the, at the economic growth, you, you have to determine whether you are using the, the, the nominal GDP or the real GDP, which the real GDP actually incorporates inflation. So an increase in real GDP, uh, GDP will actually give you the real economic growth. But on the other side, an increase in nominal uh, GDP might actually give you a false economic growth. So you have to factor inflation uh, into that. So how much the GDP will actually tell you how much economy uh, has grown, uh, which is like uh, over maybe two, three or last five years. When you actually compare the, the GDPs, uh, particularly the real GDP over those uh, five year periods, when you actually do a retrospective like a GDP analysis. So how do you then look at the GDP growth and development? Let's look at this. An improvement in the country's well-being cannot occur without an increase in the real GDP. What does that, uh, that mean? It really means that yeah, the productivity rate in terms of producing these goods and services, when you actually combine the government and the private sector, will actually tell you whether the economy is, is, is growing and the, the people's lives are improved in terms of their well-being, you know. So if, if, the, if the real growth in terms of the productivity, in terms of the goods and services is shrinking, that means the lives of the people is, is most probably going to be negatively affected, where people lose jobs, where people like don't have as much to eat, where, and, 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 and use for transportation and accommodation as they would have done in the previous financial years. So uh, one of the criticisms though of the gross domestic product is that sometimes you find that on average, the real gross domestic product is improving over time. That is, it, it is increasing. 
but you but you find that the majority of the people within that uh, country are not really uh, feeling that, uh, that 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 increase. A lot of people are, are poor. A lot of people do not really have like the right transportation, whether public or pri or private, and many other indicators of 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 well being of human well being. So now, what happened is the the economists actually came about with something that will actually look at an average growth per person within an within a, an economy. So they actually came up with what is called as per capita income, a measure of our individual benefits from increases in the real GDP. So this is basically you know, a, a division, I mean, where you divide the total real GDP with the number of, of people that live within that country. That means the total population of that country. And then the average number that you get there is called the per capita income or the per, uh, per capita real GDP. So in other words, like I've said, a real uh, per capita income is your GDP divided by population size. And, and that actually more or less gives you an indication of whether the, the, the people's well-being is actually improved when you look at an individual basis rather than looking at an overall country, you know, which might actually give you false indication. Um, inflation, let's talk about inflation because when you look at GDP, GDP, like I said initially, can either be looked at as a nominal value or as a real value. And the real value actually incorporates inflation. And it is a very essential that we understand what inflation is all about, the, def the definition of inflation. So inflation is merely a general rise in the, in the, in the level of prices, you know, where you actually uh, look at the, um, at the, at the level of the prices, generally speaking, you know, within an economy. And you look over time, if these price levels are generally increasing or decreasing, if they are generally increasing, so that's basically what is called as inflation because they are all overall inflated. But if it's, it's, the, it's the opposite, they go down, it's actually called a deflation. But now let's, let's just focus on inflation, the, the, the general rise of level of prices. So there are two types of inflation. So there are inflation, there is inflation that is caused by like a, an increase in demand. In other words, when people become more wealthier, they have more money and they consume a lot of goods and services. They actually squeeze out, you know, the, the, the the, 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 the supply of goods and services. And they actually force you know, the, the suppliers of these goods and services to increase the prices so that those who can afford more can actually af uh, can, can, be, can have access to the available goods and services. So that type of, um, of inflation is called the demand pool inflation. So this is the inflation that is influenced by an increase in the general level of demand. You know, in other words, too much spending chasing too few goods. So is there, in other words, if I can use a slang, is the survival of the fittest. In other words, those who can afford more will actually have access to those goods. So it's, 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 it's forcing the suppliers of the goods and services to, to increase. But on the other side, there, there's inflation that is influenced you know, by the scarcity of the inputs in, or the resources that are used you know, to produce these goods and services. So when, when the firms and, and the factories, uh, like for example, experience the scarcity of the resources that they use to produce goods and services, they, they actually are forced, excuse me, they actually are forced to increase the prices so that they can uh, get more money as they would have gotten in the past because these resources are getting more expensive and more scarce. So in other words, cost push, um, cost push inflation, inflation, which is actually influenced by the, the, uh, the, the cost of production, the increasing cost of production is an external rise in the prices of key resources known as the supply shock. Like for example, here I've made a, like an example about the oil shocks in the 1970s. 
and also the sudden large rent depreciation in South Africa in 1996, 98, and in 2001. So in, in, in these like, days, we can actually talk about um, the COVID-19. The COVID-19, uh, because of the lockdown restrictions, you find that most of the, uh, of, of the manufacturers of these goods, and I mean, of the components that are used to produce these goods and services are not operating in, in, in their full capacity. And that actually uh, forces you know, the cost of production to go up, you know, and then that actually, and there was a, a, an era during the, the lockdown phase where the, the food prices were actually skyrocketing, specifically because of the, the increase in the cost of production. So when you look at inflation, when you talk about inflation, inflation can be caused by two factors. The factors that are, uh, are influenced by increased demand or the factors that are influenced by you know, the, the increase in the cost of production. So note that you need to consider inflation in your budget analysis because you might find that the, uh, the, the, the inputs that you use you know, to, to, uh, to provide the services to the, to the communities, to the constituencies, you know, would have their, their prices increased you know, because of either demand pool or because of cost push. So when you do budgeting and you do budget analysis, you really, really need to, to look at, the, at, at inflation. Otherwise, if you don't do that, your analysis will give you like a false um, results. So let's, let's talk about uh, the government policy. Government um, uses two major policies. These policies are it's, it's fiscal policy and monetary policy. The fiscal policy is the policy that is used by the cabinet in terms of the government uh, institutions like your ministries or your government department. And, and the, the monetary policy is used by the, the central bank. And more often, in fact, in theory, the, the, the central bank and the government institutions are supposed to, to operate a, a, independently. They don't need to influence each other. So the monetary policy and the fiscal policy, they actually complement each other and they don't really uh, work as a, 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 from one institution. So in this, in, in this uh, presentation, we are going to look at the fiscal policy, which is like uh, specifically looking at the policy that is used by the government cabinet, uh, to, uh, I mean, through the government ministries. So this is an attempt on the part of the government to influence the economy by changing by changes in the expenditure and taxes. So there are two instruments that are used, you know, to influence the fiscal policy. The first one is the government expenditure in terms of the budget that we have spoken about. The second one is the government taxes. The taxes are used as, a, as an instrument to for government revenues. So the government will have uh, the ability to spend the money once they've got the sources of money. And the major sources of money within any government is normally through taxes. So the main instrument of fiscal policy is the budget. So where the government have like a, a government programs, where the government provides service delivery through those programs. And these programs are used to implement the policy like we have discussed in the first section of this presentation. So, these budgets are very, very critical because uh, budget, uh, the budget is thus the most important economic tool that the government has to guide uh, socioeconomic development and secure a sustainable rising improvement in the quality of lives. So in other words, if, if the economy in terms of the gross domestic product is shrinking, the tax base of the government also shrinks and that actually affects you know, the ability of the government to guide the socioeconomic development. So the people become less uh, fortunate, they become less of, of uh, I mean, uh, of, of individuals when the, the, the economy is shrinking. But on the other side, if the economy is, is growing and your real GDP is growing, therefore the government will manage to extract more taxes and the government expenditure will increase in terms of uh, infrastructure development in terms of roads, schools, um, uh, hospitals, 
and so forth and so on. And, and the government will actually make a lot of like a contribution in the economy. So the government's fiscal priorities are reflected in, the, in its budget. So if you really want to see, you know, the priorities of the government, most people, they will actually look at the policy imperatives and objectives, but all, uh, neglect the budget. And that's where you actually see, you know, the priorities of the government, because the government will only allocate resources in terms of financial resources where their priorities are. 